Hey, welcome back. I think we'll get started. It's 11 o'clock. Sunny? Hmm? Rajesh will be 10 minutes late. Okay, we'll, uh, we're going to get started now. Um, the second session of the AGM, we have a couple of reports. Uh, we'll start out with the APNIC EC report, followed by a treasurer report, followed by two um, SIG reports, Corporation SIG and NIR SIG, uh, followed by an uh, open mic. Um, before I go into the formal uh, EC report, um, I would also encourage uh, our members to download a copy of our annual report and go through the details there, because the annual report and the survey report have a lot more detailed information about you know our activities from last year. Uh, the EC report is a very very short you know summary and some of the highlights of uh, what we did uh, last year. So, it started, oh, where is the clicker, okay. So I'll, I'll present the APNIC EC report. Thank you, Art. So this is, uh, these are our current uh, APNIC EC members. Uh, we have all of them here except for James. Uh, we went to the introduction this morning, uh, so I'll uh, not go much into it, uh, but please feel free to talk to any one of us anytime you want. Uh, the functions of the APNIC EC, uh, we are, seven of us are elected members, uh, elected by the members um, to the board, and Paul is an ex officio member. Uh, being the Director General of APNIC. Uh, we have an oversight over APNIC activities. Um, we do have broad policy issues and, you know, oversight over strategic uh, direction of APNIC itself. Uh, one of the fiduciary duties we have is to make sure that we have the right fees. Um, APNIC is a not-for-profit, so, you know, we try to constantly look at our income and our expenses and try to set the fees accordingly. And as I said earlier, uh, we have reduced fees a few times in the past couple of years as the number of uh, members have grown. Um, and then one of the other jobs we do is we actually have endorsement powers over the policies that come up for ratification to the EC. Um, as I like to say to those who ask me how does the EC work, I think it's a pretty dual role. We have an obligation and a fiduciary duty towards making sure the APNIC PTY LTD, which is our secretariat, functions properly, is solvent, and at the same time, we have the responsibility being a member elected representative to the board that we keep a lookout for our members' interest, as well as the interest of the wider internet community in the region and across the world. APNIC EC meetings are held four times a year. Um, there are four face-to-face -face meetings uh, and one teleconference held since uh, the last AGM in Auckland. Um, we had a joint board meeting with the RIPE NCC board uh, in May 2016. Uh, we had an extended EC meeting or a board retreat, uh, which is an annual activity in Brisbane in the office uh, in November. Uh, the record of all these meetings, the minutes and the records of attendance are all on the APNIC website. Uh, you can go to apnic.net slash EC um, to get hold of all of them. Uh, generally, all things are discussed in the face-to-face -face meeting, but now and then uh, we do hold teleconferences if there are urgent issues that needs decision. So this is the attendance record. We have a fairly good attendance record in the last uh, uh, year, and we hope to continue having that. 
So the main things from last year, um, in 2016 we conducted a survey. Um, the survey is conducted on behalf of the EC um, so that we can get inputs from our members. Uh, we have two meetings a year and APNE training team and engagement team works with our members quite extensively throughout the year. There are many, many, you know, activities, many, many trainings, but at the same time, the survey is used to get a, a concise and, you know, overall feedback from our members every two years. Um, so we thank you for your participation in the survey and in the focus groups. Uh, the full survey report uh, is available on the APNIC website as well as the response to the survey by the EC. Um, we are fully committed to using the results from the survey to improve the APNIC services um, and to, you know, look at strategic programs for our members and stakeholders. So we also, after the survey in 2014, uh, we had this uh, feedback that, hey, you did the survey and you said that you would do some of these things. How do you know what is the status of those things? So we have a survey response tracker. And so if you go to that uh, link, uh, which is on the website, on the slide up there, um, you'll find what is the progress against some of the items that have been identified in the survey as being important to the members. Uh, some of these things are really minor, like, hey, make it easy for us, right? You know, the trying to get a certificate to use my APNIC is too tedious, fix that. And that was fixed. Now we use standardized two-factor authentication tools uh, for people to use the my APNIC system. Some of those are technical, simple. Some of those are more broad. Like one of the things that came out of the survey this year was we need to increase participation in our PDP process. And you know, that is no magic bullet for that and we'll keep working on that. Finances, uh, last year we saw the largest ever membership growth in 2016. As of 31st December, APNIC has roughly 6,000 members. I say 6,000, I think it's, you know, uh, give or take. Um, we had 726 new members in 2016. Uh, we have approved the activity planning and budget for this year. Uh, as a you know, Kenny will present the treasurer report which will go into details of our finances. But one of the things we did uh, a couple of years ago was to take our financial reserves and uh, put in an investment policy. And now we realize that, uh, you know, the investment portfolio is significant and uh, sometimes the entire board or the executive council may not have the time to deal with it. So uh, we've set up a new committee, um, subcommittee on the EC. Uh, it's called the Investment Subcommittee. Uh, the two initial members of it are James Spensley and Richard Brown. Um, and, you know, they have been tasked to find a third member. Um, the other activity we undertook last year, and I've been looking at this for a couple of years now, is, uh, you know, since 2012, uh, we have had a moratorium on new NIR applications. Um, since then, we've asked KPMZ to conduct an extensive review of the NIR framework, and um, they presented it to us in November 2016. So we continue to discuss the options available for us, and uh, we have had some very good options presented to us right now, and I think we'll have uh, something uh, bigger to share with the membership at the next meeting. Uh, at the higher level, we continue to have our engagement with ICANN. Um, you know, last few years, we spent a lot of time on the INR transition business. Um, that was done in September, uh, but that does not mean that our engagement disappears. In fact, uh, now we have an even bigger role uh, as a collective to keep an eye on the PTI, um, the full form of which I can never remember this is. Um, <coughs> So, um, in terms of uh, formal engagements, uh, APNIC as part of the NRO, um, we nominate the NRO nominates two board members to the ICANN. Um, that was completed last year, and uh, my predecessor as the chair of APNIC EC, uh, Akinori Maimura, 
uh, was uh, nominated uh, to the ICANN board. So uh, I don't see my Murasan around here, but uh, congratulations to him. Um, this week we met with Akinori, um, Asa uh, Kave, and Ronda Silva, uh, four ICANN board members. Um, we started these ad hoc meetings at the last APNIC meeting, and I think we're getting really good interaction at a high level. Uh, nothing concrete has come out of it as in terms of signing any documents, but I think the engagement is proving really useful. Um, and as, as I said earlier, Akinori and Ron are the ASO representative on the ICANN board. As a part of the post-transition INA business, um, the RIRs were to nominate uh, three members to the ICANN review committee. Um, and instead of, uh, because of the time constraint, the APNIC EC resolved to nominate two, the two elected um, AS, NRO, and C members uh, to the review committee as well. And we nominated George Kuo as the non-voting third uh, appointee who is an APNIC staff. So, you know, because this was a very tight deadline and a short uh, time frame for us to get this done, we, uh, the current term for the nomination is a year. Uh, we are looking deeper into it to see if it makes sense for us to set up a completely new process to elect these uh, members of the review committee or continue doing it the same way. Um, we, we, we don't know yet, but right, as of now, right now, all the other RIRs also follow the same uh, mechanism that they have nominated their existing NRONC members uh, to the review committee. The roles and responsibilities of the review committee are there. Uh, these are the three uh, uh, people we've nominated to the review committee. Project uh, N, Tomohiro Fujisaki, and George Kuo. The other big uh, achievement or completion of activity for us last year and uh, something that Paul talked about earlier uh, was we've completed the incorporation of the APNIC Foundation. The foundation is incorporated in Hong Kong. Um, this week in our EC meeting, we approved a 10-year um, AOC to be signed between APNIC and APNIC Foundation. This AOC uh, provides a high-level guideline um, to the APNIC Foundation on how it relates and interacts with APNIC and uh, a kind of high-level structure uh, for the co cooperation between the two bodies. Uh, we are in the process of registering the foundation as a charitable organization in Hong Kong, and we are actively recruiting board members to the APNIC Foundation. So if members have um, some suggestions uh, for potential board members, please do let us know. Uh, if you notice something on the slide, if do you see something which you think is wrong or feel not comfortable about? Come on. I'm trying to get some excitement into this dry. <laughs> Paul Anderson. Oh, the slide is on this side. You look at that, apnic.foundation is the domain name. So we've officially entered the new GTLD business, uh, no.com, .net, .org, but we've chosen the new domain name, apnic.foundation. And I had a couple of, uh, you know, I think it's just the way the internet is changing and, you know, good to highlight that. So we have to be careful that domains are not always three-letter words anymore. Um, uh, special thanks uh, to James uh, Spensley, um, who served on the EC for the last eight years and his terms end today. Um, he's been the treasurer for the EC for the last, I think the last eight years. And so we thank you, thank him for his service. The EC welcomes member feedback. Um, if you are an APNIC member and have access to my APNIC, uh, there is a form that you can fill out to send feedbacks. You can also email to xxsec at uh, apnic.net. And, you know, obviously you can meet us face to face during these uh, APNIC meetings. You can find more information about the EC and the activities, including the minutes of the meetings and things like that during the 
uh, at, on our website. Uh, this is the picture of the current EC members, all of eight of us in the Brisbane office in November. Thank you. I'll take questions, if any. Thank you, everyone. Now, the next uh, report will be from Kenny Huang. Uh, we'll do our uh, treasury reports because uh, James is not here. Good morning. Uh, this is Kenny Huang. I'm happy to give a treasury report. Sorry. Okay, basically, the treasury report was split into two parts. The first part is year 2016 financial report, second part is 2017 this year, budget and activity payment. So, we go into the first part, 2016 financial report. Uh, here's a sum summary about what happened for last year. Uh, we have surpassed 2.2 million, uh, 2.2 million exceeding budget by 860,000 uh, Australian dollars. And the dollar I mentioned here is all Australian dollars. And revenue exceed budget about $825,000. And that's uh, uh, about 4.2 uh, uh, about the budget. And it spends less than budget of $41,000. Equity position increased by $2.3 uh, million. Financial stability measure increased to uh, seven, almost 17 months of the operational expenditure. And we also uh, claim to be an unqualified audit opinion. Okay, go to the first part, operating surplus. Uh, for year 2016, our budget 1.4 million dollars, but actually we got a 2.2 uh, million dollars, and the budget variation is almost close to 61.9 percent, because uh, the major revenue come from, uh, we have uh, increased in the number of membership. Uh, here is the detail for the revenue. As mentioned, uh, we have the year 2016, the actual revenue is up to 20.3 20, uh, 20 million dollars, and our budget was 19.5 uh, million dollars. Uh, so we have 4.2% uh, about the budget. The expense in 2016 and the actual expense for and we almost close to our budget, only 0.2% variance. We split into four different activity codes. The activity code was uh, including corporate, corporate and global cooperation and regional development and serving members. And you can see the actual expense is pretty much consistent with what we budget last year. And major cost uh, goes to serving members. So here also break down into the four categories, including corp corporate expense, global co cooperation, and regional development, and serving members in different categories in detail. If you want to see the detailed financial report, you can go to APNIC transparency page. Here we will list all the detailed financial report. So another part is CAPEX, capital expenditure. Uh, last year, uh, the actual year 2016 actual expenditure is uh, $821,000, uh, that's below what we budget. What we budget was $1.8 million, and that's CAPEX. And pretty much of the office, finance, uh, office furniture and also equipment, um, because we adopt the cloud service, so that's why this cost was reduced last year. And some of the cost properties incurred this year in two, uh, 2017. That's our statement of financial position. As I mentioned, we have pretty healthy financial position, and un until end of two, uh, 2016, our total net asset is 25.6 million, million Australian dollar. Uh, we increased 10% compared to last year. 
Let's APN get reserved. Uh, so far, you can see we have uh, different colors. In, in uh, blue color stands for cash, and yellow color stands for different kind of financial asset. And uh, the purple color stands for property, and you can see our five, uh, different reserve uh, put here. So our financial stability measure, uh, the number of months covered by our equity is, as I mentioned, is 17 months. And the initial target for EC defined, the initial target was 18 months of operating expenditure. So actually, we are pretty much close to what we target. Yeah, 17, 17 months is very healthy, very strong financial position. Oh, you can see the membership growth because in the last year, we have very strong membership growth. Actually, uh, right now, our membership is reached over uh, 6,000 members. And so a lot of members was increased in last year, new member. Last membership by different economy, and still you can see a lot of members come from Australia, Hong Kong, India. So we have audit rotation policy. PwC undertook audit of 2016 account, and that's considered as a three-year of their five-year term as a panic auditor. So audit outcome including uh, PwC provide an unqualified audit, audit opinion, including the account give a true and fair view of a financial position, also complying with the relevant accounting standards. So second part of the uh, Treasury report is uh, this year, 2017 budget and activity plan. So for the second part of uh, budget uh, activity plan, and we, our activity plan and priority was driven input from, as I mentioned, and uh, uh, including 2016 APNIC survey. So uh, the survey was considered very, very important input to, to adjust our uh, priority. And also, easy strategic guidance, uh, easy conduct every four years, have a design a strategic plan. And also consider combined with APNIC's existing operational commitments, such as we have special commitment in a certain area, such as internet governance, so that will be driven and impact the activity plan. And that's a bottom up zero base expenditure, uh, expense budgeting. Budget consideration in 2017 also incorporate with 2017 activity plan, a view of APNIC expense grouped by activity, as I mentioned, that's different activity, allocation including a full-time employee operating and capital expenditure, including detailed major initiative and project for 2017s. And APNIC maturity status for tax purpose is currently for three years, ending at end of this year, 2017. So a new application will be lodged with the taxation office later this year and try to uh, extend another three years. Uh, anyway, try to extend as long as possible. So budget and activity plan available at, as I mentioned, APNIC.net transparency. You can find out from the web page. Our provision and allowance for 2017, including uh, we set up an APNIC foundation as introduced previously, and we have two APNIC senior staff and and to the foundation in two, uh, 2017, uh, 2017, and secretarial support to be charged to the foundation. Provisioning for capacity building also increased com uh, community engagement activity, training concurrent curriculum development, and increased technical assistance services. The budget revenue for this year, 2017, uh, is 21.6 million, that's 6.4 percent higher than last year. And the budget expense, uh, budget expense for 2017 is 20.6, uh, 20 almost 20.7 million dollars. That's 40 percent higher than last year. The surplus projection for 2017 is uh, 900, uh, 922,000 dollars, thousand dollars. That should be less than the variation that compared to last year is uh, less than 59 percent. Capital expenditure this year, 2017, is $1.292,000. Uh, $1 the activity plan also including serving member, regional development, and outreach global cooperation and corporate. And we spread down into capex and expense, and also full-time employee. You can see most of the full-time, um, most of the cost goes to uh, serving member, uh, including we have 45.8. Uh, like uh, full-time employee, like consider total full-time employees at uh, 59 percent, and major expense also in the serving members. 
also break down into different, different activity code. Last show from different projection showing in different color based on the four activity codes. So remember, regional development and global cooperation and corporate. Okay, that will be pretty much the end of my treasury report. If you want to see the detail, as I mentioned, go to epic.net slash transparency. You can find the full detailed report. Uh, okay, that will be the end of my presentation. Any question? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, no questions? Good. Uh, now we'll go to the SIG reports. Uh, the first SIG report would be a report on the cooperation SIG by Dr. Govin. Thank you, Chair. So I'm going to present the SIG cooperation uh, report. The SIG meeting was held on 27th of February this past Monday. The meeting session began with the election of the chair and the co-chair because the, their term ended uh, by this, uh, this uh, ethnic meeting. So I was elected as the SIG chair and Billy Chon as elected as the SIG co-chair. The, we have set up the agenda, the theme of this session as the connecting the next billion challenges and opportunities. And the, there were five speakers. The Ali Michelle was from ICANN Aprilo, talked about the Aprilo reaching out to the next billion. Asia Pacific and the next billion challenges in digital inclusion was done by Satish Babu from ICANN Aprilo. Challenges of growing internet connectivity in India was presentation was made by Mr. Bridges Jain, Citicom Networks Private Limited. The connecting the next billion was from the ISOC perspective was made by Raul Beria. And the role of Internet Society of China in China's internet development was made by Dr. Ken Kaili. As you are aware, the Asia Pacific consists of the largest 56 economies. And there are many challenges in terms of penetration, like the diversity of languages, diversity of terrain, uh, the low internet penetration, high internet penetration, the languages, the, the different kind of landscapes. So these presentations made were covered variety of these issues and how to tackle them and what are the issues which need to be put forward in this kind of thing. And this, uh, then, the, then there was a general session which took on the accountability work in the ripe region by Nurani and Phyllis. They made their perspective on the ripe region and in the post crisp reason, how it is going to tackle in the number resources uh, area. The, uh, after this, what we are thinking of in the, uh, our SIG cooperation is the kind of making the sessions more interactive, more involved in the, the community players to see that what kind of agenda we can set it up in the next ethnic meetings. And that, that's where the Izumi's, uh, I mean, proposal came yesterday, where we look forward to a more interactive sessions in this kind of cooperation, because this is comparatively new SIG uh, cooperation, where the more public policy issues of the internet and related stuff is going to be discussed. This is the combined photo of the, all the speakers and the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Govind. Any questions on the cooperation SIG? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Yep.
Now I'd like to request Sam Nair to do his presentation on the NIRC. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm here to present uh, the NIR six session report, which was held on 28th of uh, February, which uh, that is on Tuesday. We had this session uh, at between 11 to 12:30 p.m. We had around 51 participants. So uh, we had uh, eight presentations, and uh, presented by around nine speakers. Uh, all the NIR community members have presented their updates uh, during the session. And uh, we have a session uh, by Mr. Billy Chion on data-driven DNS security. We have given uh, sufficient time for the interactive session also, which is uh, one of the agenda we are actually planning in the future also that more interactive uh, sessions with the speaker we can provide. Uh, there were some suggestions also that how it can be done in future so that we will implement in the future sessions of SIG. And approximately this time also we have given uh, half an hour for the interactive sessions with the speakers. And, uh, uh, and we had some healthy uh, discussions uh, this time. So uh, this is our speakers. Uh, uh, all the presentations are uploaded in the site, happening site, you can have a look. And all the discussions, including uh, the interactive session transcripts are available in the happening website. Uh, please have a look and if you have any queries, you can definitely reach out to the sick chairs. Uh, uh, that's it, uh, that's the update, thank you. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> any questions for the NIR SIG? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I thank uh, my co-chair also, uh, Mr. Ajay and Mr. Zent, who supported for this session. Thank you. We, we have been moving pretty fast with these reports. Uh, so, Chehu around. I, I think we would go ahead with the uh, APIX report right away. Um, Professor Seng around. Let's see, I mean, I think we could do with both the reports uh, in this session and then, then go to the open mic. Hi, Good. I'm Chi Hu. Uh, I'm doing the APIX update uh, for the APIX uh, Association. <coughs> As I just mentioned, um, APIX is an association of IXP inter-exchange points in Asia-Pacific region. And you know IX very well, so I won't go through this. Uh, and uh, well, the reason why we need an association is because we are doing the same business and uh, we face the same issues. And uh, we want to have a platform for the IXP operators to share information, experience on not just technical operational no issues, but also business issue and other you know, complicated issues. And uh, up to this meeting, we had uh, Toyama Sang as our chair, and also AJ Kumar, Gavin, myself, and Brian. And uh, now we have 25 uh, members from uh, 17 countries or economies, and we just have two new members uh, and one uh, country economy uh, to our you know, membership. And the new members are Mumbai IX from India and also PH Open IX from Philippines. Uh, Philipp uh, well, we have uh, uh, one more country, which is uh, Philippines, uh, on our list. And yeah, we had our meeting on Sunday before uh, Epicos started. And this time we had uh, 54 attendees, uh, which is 
not the largest, but yeah, at least I think uh, it's, uh, it was very well attended. And uh, regarding the meetings, we had uh, technical operational discussions, including the supposed to be a authoritative database uh, for you know our all our participants, and also we had very technical discussion related to monitoring, debugging uh, IX platform uh, done by M6, and we also like uh, uh, exchange uh, ideas about how to deal with. Uh, our participants, uh, which announced a lot of routes to our route server done by JPNAM. And of course, we have uh, ISP updates uh, you know, amongst ourselves. And administrative issue, uh, you have, we finally started uh, charging for membership, uh, but it's only like 100 US dollars per year, it's a very nominal fee. And, uh, and because of that, we we are going to change our bylaw a bit, uh, saying that uh, uh, if members do not pay, then they are not uh, eligible to vote. And, uh, but this time we, we didn't, well, we, 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 it's, it was not effective. It will be effective uh, in the next meeting. And uh, we had a steering committee uh, election, and I'll talk about that later. And uh, we also talk about the open peering events. I'll talk about that later. And um, we have, uh, you know, uh, two new uh, steering committee members this time. Toyama Sang from Japan and I from Hong Kong uh, have to step down because we have served on steering committee for more than four years, for four years in fact. And um, this time we have Su and uh, Harry Hando, uh, both from IX to join our uh, steering committee, and AJ Kuma uh, will stay. And uh, we'll have a new chairman, uh, Brian Kim from Korea, and uh, we, I, I think he will help us to go to a new direction. And Gavin, of course, uh, will continue to serve us. And I think uh, the most important thing that we would like uh, the new open peering uh, events in Asia Pacific. This is a open uh, peering events, uh, probably the first uh, in our region, and um, we'll hold it in early November in a beautiful city, Kyoto, in Japan. And the host will be BPIX, Equinix JP, JPIX, and JPNAB. I think uh, from what I heard, some of them actually will have the 20th anniversary this year. So this is a very you know, uh, uh, good event for us, not just for networking, but also for uh, us to celebrate you know, their 20th anniversary. And, uh, I, and I hope uh, you can join, uh, it's open, and uh, so long as you have uh, a network uh, to operate with an AS number and do interconnection, uh, you're welcome to join. And, and so, mark on your Canada. And that's all. And uh, the last thing I want to say, although I'll be with AP Nick, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I need to thank AP Nick uh, for supporting APIX uh, because you know the venue and everything actually uh, is supported by AP Nick. And thanks. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Chi Hu. Yeah, indeed, uh, I think uh, as one of the founding SC members of the APIX, I would also thank APDIC for the continued support uh, and the community because uh, I think it's grown pretty well and uh, more and more members are joining APIX. Uh, next, we would like to request uh, Professor Seng to present on the IPv6 readiness measurement buff. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shen Xiongzhen. I'm from Titevnik. It's my great pleasure to introduce the uh, report of IPv6 readiness measurement board. And 
Next, okay. And firstly, I will briefly introduce the current status, and then I will show the, data, the result of the data analysis according to the three common criteria. And finally, I will give a conclusion. And the latest BOF meeting was held in this Tuesday afternoon, and uh, we have invited five speakers, including uh, Ajay from India and Dong Xin from Kisat, Korea, and uh, Ong Nin Yuan from Viennik, and Fujisaki Song from NTT Japan, and uh, Jing Hen Gu from Tidemnik. There are about 14 attendants in this both meeting. And I'd like to briefly introduce the report. And firstly, the Ajay uh, in introduced the current status of IPVC's uh, deployment in India. And Ajay said the Department of Telecom in India prepared a roadmap for adoption of IPv6 in the network of all stakeholders. And uh, Ernet India is conducting training for government officials free of cost. And uh, IREM is dedicating the IPv6 resources virtually free, and Reliance Geo is running on IPv6 from its first day, and the 90 million LTE customers are on IPv6. And the second speaker is Dong Wu Xin from Kiza. And he introduced the current status about the IPv6 deployment in Korea. And besides, uh, I'd like to mention here, and Kiza uh, ut has utilized the Correlation coefficient analysis, and uh, sev uh, we, we can find several interesting observations. Uh, they calculated the, the correlation coefficient between the IPv6 usage rate and the other variables for the 171 countries. And the result shows the countries having higher number of IPv4 uh, GDP per capita and all ICP indexes tend to have higher rate of IPv6 deployment as well. For example, for a country has more IPv4 allocated, it tends to have higher IPv6 usage rate with a correlation coefficient 0 0.62. It's very interesting observations. And the third speaker is a uh, Ruan Ning Yuan from Viennik, uh, she introduced the current status about the IPv6 deployment in Vietnam, and uh, it shows Vietnam has better result of IPv6 deployment. And as a result of the deployment, uh, we can find there are big differences among the different ISPs, and uh, there are many IPv6 promotion policies. It seems to me uh, these policies are very successful. So, and the next speaker is fujisaki Song from NTT. fujisaki Song said uh, many fixed-line ISPs have started the IPv6 service for both enterprise and the consumer users. And the three major cellular carriers announced they will start full IPv6 service in this year. And the one of them have started already the, uh, the IPv6 service in last year. And IPv6 ready government services are increasing, but the large content providers do not support IPv6 yet. And the cost, uh, because the cost of dual stack network management is so high, so maybe the uh, IPv4 as a service is, is ongoing uh, worldwide, and it's uh, good news. So, and so the last speaker is Jin Hen Gu from Tiedermnik. Uh, Jing Hen uh, updated the status of the IPv6 upgrade in Taiwan government, academia, and the ISPs. And uh, he updated the status of three common measurement criteria. Uh, he shows the result of the hotspots of iTaiwan have provided the IPv6 public Wi-Fi services in last year. And uh, this service will be expanded uh, in this year. Uh, the old, uh, in, in the old uh, Taiwan island. And now I'd like to show the data analysis result of the IPv6 readiness according to the three common criteria. Uh, 
Let's take a look at the first common criteria. That is the IPV is a location in the BGP advertisement. According to the RIPE NCC statistical re result, uh, as you can see, the average of the IPV6 BGP advertisement has arrived at 26.1% in last year, and the growth rate is about 1.4% compared to the year 2015. And, and Thailand and the Vinland are the fast growing countries in last year. Uh, now let's take a look uh, at the second common criteria, is the service availability. Uh, basically, it's only in the web service availability. Uh, according to the ARISA data from the ARISA top 500 uh, web services for each CCTLD, uh, as you can see, the average of the IPv6 service availability has arrived at 12.94% in last year, and the growth rate is about 6.64% compared to the year 2015. Uh, in this year, Malaysia and the Vietnam are the fast-growing countries in last year. Now, let's take a look at the third common criteria is uh, user availability. According to the APNIC survey data, uh, we can find the average of the IPv6 user availability has arrived at 6.98% in last year, and the growth rate is about 3.4% compared, compared to the year 2015. India and the Vietnam are the fast-growing countries in terms of this measurement criteria. Finally, I'd like to show the comparison of the results of the LACNIC and the Cisco. Uh, this measurement are the overall measurement of the IPv6 deployment. Uh, the LACNIC proposed a new indicator. It's so-called the ICAV6. This indicator is with higher weights applied to the planning stage. Uh, as you can see in this graph, the blue color stands for the LACNIC indicator, and the red color stands for the Cisco indicator. Uh, we can find the LACNIC indicator results of the uh, deployment ratio by LACNIC uh, are consistently and uh, smoothly greater than the ratios by Cisco. Oh, it's very interesting uh, results. So finally, I'd like to make a conclusion. The growth rates in three common criteria uh, show that there's a lot of progress in the IPv6 deployment in the Asia Pacific region. And different methodology and the criteria of readiness measurement are very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Seng. Do we have any questions for the IPv6 measurement buff? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes here left uh, on the time assigned for Bobs. Um, I know that during this week, um, we have had a lot of Bobs. I think I have never seen so many Bobs at an Africor program in, in many, many years. Um, quite a few of those were very re relevant to APNIC activities. In fact, I, I ran one of those Bobs. Uh, but before I would go into that, um, anyone here who ran a buff wants to talk about it? Got a couple of minutes, Sanjay? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Sanjay from uh, APNIC. We ran a uh, data gathering and analysis buff on Tuesday evening. Uh, the background for that both is um, we've, uh, as the APNIC secretary, received quite a lot of uh, requests for more information sharing. So we ask, uh, I think it's probably similar to what Chi uh, Hu presented uh, at the APX report just now, that APNIC members run networks and they experience the same problems and would like to share more information. So. Uh, the question that we ask on the survey is uh, would our members or community members be interested to uh, contribute data that we can collate and then make uh, and then share back to the community 
And the response to that survey is quite positive. Uh, 47, I think, uh, said yes, and then another 30 odd uh, said we need more information. So we had this buff to answer that question. And the outcome of that, uh, and then there was two presentations in that buff. One is from um, uh, Bijal from EuroIX. Uh, sharing their experience on the benchmarking, uh, comparing uh, experience from different IXP, that is members of your IX, and also from uh, Jay Daly from NZRS. Uh, they're the uh, registry for .NZ and that have really good uh, platform to share statistics. So the outcome of the BOF is, is, is that we, we, we all like this, uh, we're going to have a, the same buff again in APN 44 Taichung, and hopefully by then we could appoint a chair or something, put a bit more structure around the discussion. That's all. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Sanjay. Did, can you also give a quick update on the IPAM? I, your buff, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I attended uh, uh, the uh, IPAM buff uh, led by, by Gorab. Uh, IPAM stands for the IP Address Management. Uh, the, this, this is a tool that most uh, probably larger uh, networks uh, use to track their distribution of IP addresses. And um, we feel, I think the, the BOF feels that if we have a good IPAM, uh, all APNIC members have a good IPAM in their hands and that IPAM can interact, for example, directly with APNIC who is then we would have a more accurate and more updated who is information. So we decided that it's uh, probably worth uh, surveying everyone in this region, what IPAM that they use, and then uh, based on that survey outcome, we'll think about the strategy to integrate that with the uh, APNIC uh, who is information. Did I capture yep. that correctly? Yep, thank you yep. for that. Um, I see Aftab, please identify yourself though. Aftab Siddiqui, Internet Society. Um, we ran uh, a BOF as well. Uh, it was uh, a BCOP uh, BOF, and uh, the background was uh, uh, there are so many BCOP activities happening in Asia Pacific region. Uh, few, um, one of the major ones is uh, run by IGF, and um, in other parts of the world in RIPE, um, in RN and Afrinic, uh, RIRs are supporting the initiatives uh, and we found that as an ISOC member um, that in, in Asia Pacific region, RIR, uh, our RIR, RIR is APNIC, they should support the initiative as well. So it was a joint BOF with APNIC uh, training team and uh, it was uh, quite constructive and um, we are planning to uh, move forward with the uh, APNIC in the region. And uh, we are looking for more volunteers. If, uh, uh, if you would like to be part of the initiative, then uh, please reach out to me or any other APNIC uh, training member or ISOC member. And we would like to um, have more volunteers on the list. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aftab. Um, I think it's uh, now we, we will not uh, continue to the next. Uh, item which was the policy SIG report until after lunch. Um, so I'd like to open the mic for the floor for any open questions, anything on the presentations presented so far or any, any other issues that, uh, that could be relevant. Please do identify yourself. Uh, I'm Rajesh Jain, ISP Association of India. This is in the context of cooperation SIG what I suggest that there is a need for uh, more focus on uh, cooperation among international co economies because it is a privacy, security versus government intervention uh, that needs to be given uh, bigger attention. So, that my, so cooperation should take up this topic uh, more specifically. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jain. Uh, 
Okay. I want to add a bit of additional um, information to the both reports that AFTAF have mentioned. And one of the best practices forum organized by IGF, the, the UN um, organized event on the internet governance. Um, last year and this year, there was best practices forum on IPv6. And um, Sumon, um, who actually is also a chair of policy SIG, and myself has worked uh, as a coordinator of this best practices forum. I want to thank um, many of the volunteers in the RIR community, including APNIC, but then also other regions who actually are policy makers and business decision makers. So um, I hope that there are some additional work that we can do within our community, uh, provide our expertise in uh, sharing and promoting something to the people who are outside um, of the technical community, more to policy people or business people. And it's a related point that um, Brajesh has mentioned, maybe we can um, make use of our cooperation SIG and how we collaborate in the area that we are actually involved in the activities, but also relevant to other forums. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Any other questions on the open mic? Lunch? <laughs> <laughs> I think if there are no questions on the open mic, then I'll... Um, Uh, hello, uh, Luhan from La Russe Cloud Service. Uh, as we have received a re uh, reply for yesterday incident we had in the policy uh, discussion list, and we like to bring it up and uh, <coughs> excuse me, and and uh, to have easy attention to the problem because uh, yesterday what happened yesterday, if the room wasn't aware, is uh, during presentation with my colleague David about our policy proposal. Uh, while we received overwhelming support in a conference system, there was accusation by every APNIC staff that the conference system was being manipulated, gamed. Uh, so we were quite upset about it because we will become top suspect if such accusation was, because such accusation was made right on the spot when we were presenting our policy and we're receiving overwhelming support. Uh, today an email uh, to the mailing list was just released by the Council General uh, to the mailing list and claimed that the accusation wasn't to us. However, yesterday I was asked by APNIC staff personally, directly, are we game the system? We said no, this is a serious accusation. Please provide evidence. And there was a list of emails ending with qq.com was posted by general counsel to the mailing list. First, I believe this is not an appropriate option by general counsel because those are personal email lists from what I can see. If uh, many of you, you, if you wasn't from China, uh, you might never heard of qq.com, but qq is uh, like Facebook in China and uh, Almost every Chinese has a qq.com ending email address. Uh, and my colleague just running through all this qq.com email address, which was posted by the general counsel. All of those accounts have existed over 10 years. So this illegitimate Chinese person was participating in the conference system. As far as we can see, we're going to do more detailed check. But the thing is, the letter the general counsel posted today to the mailing list saying we were aggressive yesterday, but we were desperate to clean our name. And uh, protecting staff is the responsibility of APNIC uh, general counsel. I agree with that. However, it must be to a certain extent. Uh, yesterday, I was being directly accused as a liar by one of the junior staff. And while I confront him, to the corridor and uh, to check the fact, he asked me to get out of his face. Literally, get out of his face. I feel being bullied. I went not making complaint, of course, I, admittedly, I was emotional, I raised my voice, because someone tell you get out of the face while you, while you be accused of a liar, 
I would say anyone would get emotional. And uh, while making complaint to his boss, general counsel come to me and threaten me to sue me out of the meeting. I've been all the IR meeting for the past 10 years. I've never had an experience like this. I've never been bullied like that way. So I would like the EC take the attention to the matter very seriously, to clean the name for our company, because all we did to propose a policy was to improve the quality of the service of APNIC for the greater good of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Lu Heng. Um, I, I will respond to this, but I do have other people on the queue, so do you like me to say, or you have something related with this topic to add? <clears throat> yeah, this is Bill Woodcock. Um, Lou, you're personalizing things again. I think the important thing is that we're a community and that we're trying to achieve the best results for the community as a whole. It's not about you, it's not about some number of people in China, it's about the community as a whole and the discussion that we have to arrive at the best possible outcomes. So a bunch of people, however many of them there actually are, who post from relatively anonymous accounts just saying yes or just saying no is not actually participating in a discussion. It's not advancing an argument. It's not convincing people of their point of view. It's not bringing informed debate to the conversation. So what we need as a community is to have informed debate about each, each of these issues and not to make it personal, not for you to get in an argument with somebody and have the conversation suddenly be about that argument. Okay? So all I'm saying is please don't waste anybody's time with your arguments about you or the fight you're having. Let's get back on topic to the actual proposals. Uh, the However, I disagree with Bill Cog because the conversation as it's designed was the, uh, given the community an impression of the community support to the policy proposal. If we have uh, an overview of the general impression to the community, it does not require you put an argument into the system before you share your opinion, and it would never does. In the history of a consensus-based system of the global, it, when at the stage of a show of hands, which give the community a general impression of support or oppose the proposal, that was not require every single person give their opinion. And while that's a general person in the region, and while I'm not sure yet, I can't vouch for all of them, or any of them per se, but we check that QQ account. It's legitimate QQ account existed over 10, 15 years. So I would largely believe they are general person living in this continent. And uh, I believe they have rights to express their opinion without providing an argument. That is is their right to do so. And that's what the conference is designed for. And I'm not wasting any of my time because the legitimacy of the conference system as well as the accusation to a community member, a community company while we're contributing is extremely important as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lu Heng. Uh, actually, we did review this uh, before Craig sent the email out. And I think uh, so far you said that, you know, uh, to summarize our policy process, and I was a policy chair at one point, our policy system is not based on anonymous uh, participation. It has never been like that. Even if people in the room did not convey the opinion, or did not identify themselves when they raised their hands, there are people that you can go and talk to and they have, they have the opinion to input. So uh, as a follow-up to this, we are emailing all those email addresses uh, registered in Confer um, and figuring out whether there were legitimate grievances because evidently the, we've reviewed the video from the session, the interaction in the room and the inputs from the confer did not match at all, and it did not align with anything that was on the mailing list so far. So, you know, we'll take this to a logical conclusion, and the policies will go back to the, you know, uh, mailing list, or I, I'm waiting for the policy sick report. It will be up to the policy sick chairs to make that determination. Uh, but as Bill said, you know, I think I, I was not there in the room yesterday, so if there are other people, I'd probably like to hear from them during the break. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, if there were 
there is an effort in which a result from the confer does not match with whatever is going on in the room or was designed on the mailing list, then, you know, the best judge of that is going to be the policy six chairs because that's, that's what they are doing there. Um, so I'll leave it to that discussion there. Uh, and we'll come up to that, you know, specific of that in the next uh, session after lunch. Uh, the other side of it where, you know, uh, if members get into ag argument with each other or if you uh, have an argument with the staff, then, you know, you can file a grievance and we'll look at it. But, you know, we'll also look at, investigate it. Uh, we've been working with Craig on that as our legal counsel. And that is a completely different issue altogether. Uh, we will not tolerate any kind of, uh, you know, abuse of anyone in this conference. And when you register for the conference, you actually explicitly agree to that. There is a code of conduct, and if there is a failure from anyone, I would make it clear that it will not be tolerated. But, you know, it has to be clearly defined. There's two different issues here, right? And if you are offended and you are emotional, I would say, say sorry, both sides, make up. It is not going to help anyone with the policy development process. And we've had so many processes, and we have people walk out of the room in the past, and we have had all of that, but, you know, it needs to be cordial at all times. And if it has not been, then I think we need to work on it and control our emotions uh, rather than get into argument about it. Because, as Bill said, you know, we're trying to develop policy and not get into fight with each other. I and totally agree with you. We shouldn't get into fight with it. However, the situation yesterday was while we received overwhelming support, one weaponic staff come forward and accusing someone of gaming the system. Later, the same staff accused me directly, are you gaming the system? So such an accusation was serious and it will be destroy our, destroying our reputation. So it would be understandable for me to get emotional and upset to come from them and ask them to provide evidence. I admittedly am an emotional person, but when I was being accusing as a liar that I think that more than four people were supporting proposal, I was simply ask them to confront the fact with me and I would be asked to get out of my face. And later on, I was complaining. And after all this, being accusing as a liar, being accusing game the citizen, it's understandably when I'm making a complaint, my voice wasn't exactly the most peaceful you can see. And because my voice wasn't exactly peaceful you can see, and uh, the general counsel here was trying to me get out of me, of me of the conference. And all I did was my voice was higher than normal, but I was not very happy that I'm open. And I was making a complaint because my company the reputation was at a jeopardy, and uh, I was be, just be asked to get out of my face by general, a junior staff. I think, uh, I'll, I'll, I think we need to put a stop to this. This is not the right place to discuss this. Uh, this is going to be he said, she said kind of discussion. But I would, I would not see how the reputation is harmed because you brought it up on the mailing list. We reviewed the video. Uh, acquisitions in private don't affect your reputation, from what I understand of the, you know, concept of reputation, right? You can have an argument, you could have, you can make a complaint about it, but as I said, I think this is not the right forum to discuss that. Uh, we'll take it offline, um, but as I said earlier, you know, you are emotional, as you said, you might have raised your voice, somebody might not like that, I think it's time to just make up, right? And be careful on all sides that, you know, you go and talk in the forum rather than uh, try to accuse each other of any activities. So let's put that there. Uh, Craig, you have something to add? I do. Um, I do want to summarize the position, uh, Garab, um, if I may. There are three issues here. Uh, the first one is the accuracy of the confer system and, and to what extent it was misused. The, first one, the second one relates to an accusation that APNIC staff somehow, by implication, publicly dis accused the proposer of Prop 118 as being the people behind the misuse of CONFER. And the third one is about the code of conduct. It, for the benefit of the people who are not on the policy seek mailing list, I have uh, set out a comprehensive response, which is what I think Ms. Lu Heng is uh, referred to. In relation to the first point about the accuracy, I mean, CONFER is a system that was intended 
to give an indication to the chair about the, the sentiment of the room. It is not a vote. Um, when it became clear that the system was being misused and we are continuing to investigate that, it was totally appropriate in my view for the chair to decide to cease using that system as a gauge of the, room, the temperature of the room and to revert to a show of hands. There was no implication or express uh, connection made to the proposer. Um, any belief that that was the case, I think, was incorrect. The third point, and the most important point that I do want to make, is about the conduct. Um, this conference, these events, are workplaces for APNIC staff and for many people here. We, me, I, will not tolerate behaviour that compromise their safety and if they are being bullied. When I spoke with Yilu Heng yesterday afternoon after the session, I witnessed personally you shouting at a staff, at APNIC staff, within very close proximity, this far away from him. Um, I came up to you and said to you that this is not acceptable. You are entitled to make complaint, do it calmly, but you are not entitled to abuse APNIC staff. And if you do that, I will have you ejected from the premises. And I say that, and we maintain that. So that's all I want to say. Um, there are more investigations uh, in relation to the confer and the access to it. Um, at the moment, it's showing me that at least 13 of the um, uh, access came from one IP address. Of course, we'll continue to, to review our logs, um, and more will come up. But that's all I want to say for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Since our direct threat is just about for me to be kicked out, I'd like to make a very last reply. I really appreciate for allowing me to speak. Uh, what he said that when, when I encountered Craig yesterday was the time I was making complaint to Pan Guangliang, uh, the junior staff's boss, about the case. I was very emotional, I admit that. But I was no, in no way no, not blind. I was in no way bullying him. And uh, if Pan Guangliang in the room, he can confirm the content I was trying to talk to him that I was just simply saying your staff will just tell me to get out of my face. And please, lawyer, confirm that. And APNIC staff tell the member to get out of his face while to confirm a fact check. Was that appropriate code of conduct to you as well? Uh, I'll take this. I think, I think it is, yes, that is a violation of the code of conduct. Nobody should be shouting in anyone's face. I mean, you know, you might be emotional, but at the same time, I don't think, however emotional you are, um, there is, should be any kind of raising of voice or shouting to people in the face. And on that thing, I think, you know, I don't think there is a different description to it than an abuse. And, you know, everybody has the right to refuse that abuse and report that appropriately. But as I said, you know, we are not here to fight. And let's take this offline and, you know, have a quick chat about it. Uh, as I said, as you said, not me, that you were emotional. Uh, Maybe the junior staff you refer to got, you know, did not understand your emotions. So, you know, let's, let's shake your hands and make up. But I'll take that offline from here uh, because it's uh, probably not relevant to the matters of the AGM today. Um, so on that topic, any other questions for the open mic? Because we have 15 more minutes to go. I'm Dr. Govind here. I just wanted to respond to Mr. Bridges Jens and Izumi's comments on the cooperation seek kind of uh, session. I agree with them that we should need a kind of good uh, topic to be discussed which is relevant to the, this Asia-Pacific region. And that's what I'm trying to do. This time we took the next billion uh, connectivity issue in this area. Now next is security is important. That can be taken and Izumi's point that internet governance is going to be a very major theme all along. So we can have a session divided into two, if possible, where we can have a one part of the session uh, aiming towards the uh, theme session and another on the internet governance and related kind of stuff. So that will give a more weightage to the, uh, the, the overarching issues for this cooperation thing. And she also said that, you know, we can discuss that in the policy, see also that depending upon the 
level of discussion which need in that kind of policy space or in the cooperation thing, we can divide the topic and we are, I'm agree with both of them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gobin. Any other questions or any other comments on the open mic? Okay, I think we can go for lunch. Uh, we will... Uh, Sunny wants to say a few things before we go for lunch. Housekeeping announcements. Thanks, Gauro. Um, first of all, I would like to remind that the voting desk is still open and it will close at 2 p.m., sharp 2 p.m., so you are most welcome to cast your vote before that. And the second one is, I'm not sure if anyone mentioned, maybe Gauro mentioned it, but uh, those black boxes are actually gifts from APNIC for you, so please take one. <laughs> Don't leave it behind. Um, I think a lot of people are getting confused, you know, why they're on the table. We just placed it on the table, so if you are sitting there, you know, that's for you to take it home. Um, and uh, just a reminder about tonight's closing dinner. Um, it's at Eliza Floating Restaurant. The buses will depart from the lobby at 6.30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. So lunch is, where is lunch? Same place? First floor. The lunch is on the cafe in the first floor and we convene back here at two o'clock. Thank you.